Father, I'm thankful to study your word. Lord, what a gift it is to just dig into your text, Lord. People that come week after week who just love you, Lord. It's not about seeing my face. It's not about seeing the ministry's face. It is about seeing your face. We want to see you, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that you'll open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law, that you'll open up our minds, that we will understand the scriptures, Father. Will you speak to us tonight? Um, Lord, where there's opportunity for us to be corrected, for us to grow in our maturity in you, will you allow your spirit to move in our hearts in that way that we will be able to look more, think more, and behave more like Christ? Lord, I pray also that the scriptures will show itself as a mirror into our souls, where there needs to be correction, Lord, that you will show us the ugliness of ourselves, Uh, Sometimes we need to come face to face with that in order for us to respond to truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you will do that both for believers as well as those who may come across this teaching who are non-believers. Lord, your word works in great and mysterious ways. So I thank you for this time. I ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I'm going to give us now a detailed Uh, description, if you will, of chapter 19. If you recall, last week we unpacked the experience of a fearful and discouraged Elijah, who not too long before, again, if you remember, he had witnessed this incredible demonstration of God's power. He had defeated the Baal worship in the north, over 450 priests of Baal. Elijah is now, at this point, forced to flee. He's forced to flee because Jezebel has gotten word from her husband that the priests have been killed by Elijah according to Torah. However, what ends up happening is he was remaining and remain reminded through these subtle ways, again, although he's fearful and discouraged, that God is good. You don't have to run away, Elijah. You don't have to be fearful. Know that God is with you. And herein lied the opportunity for Elijah's faith to really grow all the more in knowing that the Lord's word is, in fact, true. So Elijah, he goes to this wilderness. He's being fed this special meal. The scriptures told us by an angel of the Lord. I talked to you uh, you and I about uh, what I believe the angel of the Lord was in that text. I believe it's the pre-incarnate Christ who is feeding Elijah during that time. And it's there that Elijah came to the realization that his circumstances were not a means of deflation, but rather of consolation, that the Lord was with him in his dire circumstance. And again, Elijah came to realize that the Lord was actually at work already, at work already. Although Jezebel's coming for his neck, the Lord has already prepared a new prophet that's going to come in. His name would be Elisha that would come in, and there would already be two kings that would be set up in the near future that would destroy all of not only Ahab and Jezebel's people, but the Baal worship for a period of time. And it really served as a beautiful lesson. I believe when I when I walk through the text, I saw a beautiful lesson here. Hopefully you see it too. And that is that Elisha, his protege, stepping in, let us know something. That God can use whoever he needs to use, however he needs to use them. God is not so focused and fixated on you that he's not really focused on his plan. His plan is what is at stake and what he desires to accomplish. So tonight, what we're going to see is we're going to see a bit of a shift now taking place in the text. And the shift in the scene, um, although it's going to seem a bit awkward, it really all connects. There's a string that's connecting all the more. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if You want to know what the outline of our text tonight is going to look like. We're going to see five things. The first thing that we're going to see is the battle between Ahab and Ben-Hadad. That's going to be verses 1 through 25. And I'm breaking those verses into two sections. We'll first look at verses 1 through 12, which is regarding the preparation for the battle. And then we're going to see verses 13 through 25, and that's going to deal with the anticipation for the battle. Okay? We're then going to see the battle between Ahab and Ben-Hadad a second time, right? So they're going to go to war once again. 
And that's going to be a large chunk of Scripture, verses 26 through 34. And then we're going to dive into the last portion, a disguised prophet, a disguised prophet. And that'll be verses 35 through 43. And if I were to put a tag on our text tonight, it would simply be this, only by his grace, only by his grace. So with that being said, I invite you to meet me at 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 12 for the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Kings 20, verses 1 through 12. This is what it reads. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all of his army, and there were 32 kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. Then he sent messengers to the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine. Your most beautiful wives and children are also mine. The king of Israel replied, It is according to your word, my lord, O king. I am yours and all that I have. Then the messengers returned and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Surely I sent to you, saying, You shall give me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. But about this time tomorrow I will send my servants to you, and they will search your house and the houses of your servants, and whatever is desirable in your eyes they will take in their hand and carry away. So he's getting a bit greedy. He's feeling himself. Verse 7. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Please observe and see how this man is looking for trouble. For he sent to me for my wives and my children and my silver and my gold, and I did not refuse him. All the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. So he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that you sent for to your servant at the first I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, May the gods do so to me, and more also if the dust of Samaria will suffice for handfuls for all the people who follow me. Then the king of Israel replied, Tell him, let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking with the kings in the temporary shelters he said to his servants, station yourselves. So they stationed themselves against the city. Looks like it's about to go down, right? To better understand, friends, this part of the narrative and where we're picking up, we need to first realize that the spotlight is now shifting. It started with Elijah in the previous chapter, but now we're getting into a familiar character, but now in a different setting. You might recall our last time that we had encountered Ben-Hadad was when? It was in and around what? First Kings chapter 15. As a matter of fact, First Kings 15 verse 18 is when we last encountered Ben-Hadad. And this is where King Asa of Judah had partnered with Ben-Hadad against Bashar, king of the north. They had created this partnership. And this occurrence would have been some years prior to King Ahab's rise to the throne. And with the time frame between King Bashar and King Ahab, there is a difference of several years, as a matter of fact, even several kings. Last time I showed, showed us a chart, and we could bring that chart up from last time. Yeah, last week, thank you. So if you remember, if you just kind of follow that chronologically, you'll see what I mean by the fact that there are several kings in between where we see King Ahab and where we see this issue with King Bashar at that prior time. And there are some who assert at this particular part of the text that Ben-Hadad of 1 Kings 15 is not the same as that of 1 Kings chapter 20, where we are right now. That perhaps 1 Kings chapter 20 is actually talking about Ben-Hadad the second. But whatever the case is, whether it's Ben-Hadad the first or the second, we see that the king of Aram continues his discourse with the north. There's still this issue that's going on. We're told that the king of Aram attacked Samaria and began to lay siege to it. And while holding this entire city captive, Ben-Hadad is now sending his messengers in to let King Ahab know, listen, I'm surrounding you. Give me what I want. 
And the message more of an order, if you will, was that all the king's silver and gold, all of the king's wives and all of the king's children were now going to be his. To which King Ahab replied in few short words, whatever you want, however you want it, it's yours. Pretty weak response, but he's in a point of jeopardy, right? Because he's about to die. And again, this response from King Ahab was given with much haste. Notice he didn't have to think about it. He didn't contemplate on it. It was an immediate thing. And this was the case because numerically speaking, the odds were stacked against the northern kingdom. Even on their best day, friends, they couldn't defeat them. So as a means to acquiesce to the terms, Ahab sends word back to Ben-Hadad with his compliance to the terms as mentioned. Once word had gotten back to Ben-Hadad, it's as if the request that was made known to King Ahab was too easy. That was too quick for him to respond. If he's going to give that quickly to my demands here, let me ask for a little bit more. So what does he do? He says, not only do I want all of your silver, all of your gold, all of your wives, all of your children, but I want all of your servants' things too, all of their stuff. So it's after the hearing of these increased demands from Ben-Hadad that King Ahab assembles the elders of the land and he meets with them to get counsel as to how do we proceed. And like the American military, the elders of the northern kingdom agree that we do not negotiate with terrorists. You're not going to comply. You're not going to give in to this. And they let him know that don't consent to these demands. And it becomes clear that Ahab is in no position to negotiate, nor does he have a leg to stand on due to the fact that he and his entire kingdom are in a vulnerable position. However, he takes the advice of his council and acquiesces to the first set of demands, but refuses the second set of demands. I'll give you my wife and kids. I'll give you my silver and gold, but you're not getting theirs. And I think that was a pretty honorable thing in that regard. It's then in verse 10 that after word of Ahab's decision gets back to Ben-Hadad, that Ben-Hadad now threatens King Ahab with total destruction of Samaria. However, Ben-Hadad's confidence is quickly checked by King Ahab's quick-wittedness. Notice King Ahab responds by saying this, let not him who girds on armor boast like him who takes it off. In other words, that's, that's an idiom during that time. It simply means don't speak too soon before the battle has even begun. Don't you, you check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's what's happening here. Well, this message, friends, received by Ben-Hadad while he's drinking and enjoying the pleasure of this moment, feeling like I'm in control and I'm confident, he, he, at this particular point, is kind of at a vulnerable position because he's intoxicated, he's thinking he's in a position of power, but yet he fails to realize that his confidence is in the wrong thing. And because his his confidence is in the wrong thing, retaliation is eventually going to come. It's kind of like this high school band. You guys remember in high school and folks would go back and forth. Well, you did this and I did this. And they want to kind of go back and forth. Well, your mama, no, my mom, that was happening, right? With Benadad and Ahab. And now things are starting to change. He's like, Benadad, you're getting a little boastful here. Calm down, pump the brakes. Now check out what happens here as that scene is closing. Verses 13 through 25, check out the text. It says, now behold, a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, and said, thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver them into your hand today, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Ahab said, by whom? So he said, thus says the Lord, by the young men of the rulers of the provinces. Then he said, who shall begin the battle? This prophet tells him, you, Ahab. Then he mustered the young men of the rulers of the provinces, and there were, checked out these numbers here, guys, 232. And after them, he mustered all the people, even all the sons of Israel, totaling 7,000. They went out at noon while Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the temporary shelters with the 32 kings who helped him. The young men of the rulers of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, men have come out from Samaria. 
Then he said, if they have come out for peace, take them alive. Or if they have come out for war, take them alive. Again, you can see that confidence, that, that, that self-entitlement here. Verse 19, so these went out from the city, the young men of the rulers of the provinces and the army which followed them. Check out verse 20. They, meaning the northern kingdom, killed each his man, and the Arameans fled, and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on a horse with horsemen. The king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Arameans with a great slaughter. Then the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, go strengthen yourself and observe and see what you have to do. For at the turn of the year, the king of Aram will come up against you. Now the servants of the king of Aram said to him, their gods are gods of the mountains. Therefore, they are stronger than we, but rather let us fight against them in the plain and surely we will be stronger than they. Do this thing, remove the king's, each from his place and put captains in their place. Here's verse 25. And muster an army like the army that you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, meaning double your portion of what you had earlier. Then we will fight against them in the plain and surely we will be stronger than they. And he listened to their voice and did so. So while Ben-Hadad is planning his attack and he's rallying his men, we're given a peek behind the veil as to how Israel actually would defeat their enemy. And the way that this message of victory would be delivered was through another no-named prophet. We've had about two no-named prophets so far in this narrative. So this no-named prophet, he comes to King Ahab, and the message was that the Lord would deliver the Aramean army into the hands of the northern kingdom. In other words, the Lord would provide the victory for Israel. However, I want you to notice something that this statement of the Lord's delivering power was first preceded with a question. Do you see that in the text? The question was, have you seen all this multitude? In other words, what you are going up against requires an even greater force. At verse 15, it it tells us Israel's number was approximately what? 232 men in which were able to gather together to first go out in the first regime. And if worse came to worse, the sons of Israel would then be drafted in to this war, and that total amount would have been 7,000. So we're sitting at about 7,232 Israel army folks. Whereas we're told that the Aramean army contained over 127,000 men, according to verses 29 through 30. So as one friends could assume, Ahab, not knowing how this victory would be made possible, he asks the prophet, by whom would the victory be accomplished by? Because at this point, Ahab's like, listen. These numbers ain't making sense. The math ain't mathing. How in the world are we going to win? And to which Ahab then proceeds to ask the question, well, who's going to begin this battle? Right? Again, he's looking within himself to say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to win? And the prophets let him know, listen, first of all, you ain't going to do anything. The Lord is going to do this thing. The Lord is going to deliver you. The Lord is going to have you start the battle, not because you're good, not because you're great, but because he's good. And he's mighty. Notice, friends, that the Lord intervening on behalf of Ahab and Israel was not based upon Ahab having repented. At no point has there been a turning of Ahab's heart at this portion in the text. It's not based upon Ahab turning the hearts of the people back to the law. It's not a matter of Ahab having gotten it together with the Lord in a sense. Friends, the Lord is responding to Israel out of his love for his people because they're his. What a mercy that is. Grace, friends, is the means by which God extends his undeserved kindness towards those who aren't deserving of it. And if I could put it this way, the reality is if it were not for the grace of God, 
keeping us and preserving us, we too would be hopelessly lost and in dire need of saving. Yet in his kindness, what did the Lord do? He saw fit to pull you and me out of darkness and into his marvelous light, not because you did anything great, not because I did anything great, but because he is faithful. Grace, at the same time, friends, it becomes the very object by which gains our attention and our affection to turn to the Lord all the more. Grace, in other words, should be this attention getter. Because I know what I rightfully deserve, but yet didn't receive it, I'm going to turn all the more to you, Lord, because you're worthy of it. That's what you would expect Ahab to do. But as we walk through the narrative, you're going to see it doesn't happen. It's from the word of the prophet of the Lord that Ahab goes out, and he goes out, interestingly enough, in this confidence to take the enemy by surprise. And while Ben-Hadad is operating in a sense of self-assurance, knowing that because of his great number in his army that he would succeed, he actually fails to realize that it's the Lord that is working behind the army of the north in order to bring about defeat. So while he's enjoying himself and getting drunk and intoxicated, the young officers from Ahab are now sent out for a strategic purpose. Ahab sends out 232 young men in whom Ben-Hadad, unaware of their intent, is taken by surprise. You see, Ben-Hadad assumes that these men were coming to talk peace. He's assuming... Oh, they, they know they're about to lose. Let, let, let's go ahead and, and talk at the table. Go ahead, raise the white flag, and you're good. But he failed to realize, no, the God of Israel is fighting behind them. He, he fails to see this great and mighty God at work. And here's something interesting. Isn't it funny how sometimes the Lord will use our circumstances as teaching tools to recognize that he's the one that's in control, not us? I can tell you time and time again, every moment in my life where we've seen the Lord move in a mighty way and we're looking back, we're like, man, the Lord did that. He did that thing. And where our independence and our pride gets in the way, friends, it hinders us from seeing the Lord respond victoriously in our circumstance. Pride will always be the blinders by which we fail to see the grace that is extended. And in this case, Ben-Hadad witnessed for himself his army dwindle in number. Where the confidence once was because of his great numbers, it's now become deflated and he flees embarrassed for his life to another city. As a matter of fact, the writer records that this slaughter was one of great number having been accomplished by a small army. As one could imagine, this victory was well enjoyed. However, it was not to be missed that this was just the beginning. Furthermore, the prophet came again to King Ahab to recommend him to strengthen himself and to prepare. You might be asking, why is he having to strengthen himself if he's just defeated this army? Well, the prophet lets him know Ben-Hadad was going to return stronger than what he came before. Brace yourself. And perhaps, friends, this is the opportunity for Ahab to actually reflect and recognize that the only reason that this battle was won in the first place was because of the grace that Yahweh has shown. And in turn, what happens? In turn, Ahab would truly know where his strength came from. It wasn't because he was a great military strategist. It was because the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was behind him. If, if I were King Ahab, I'd fall on my knees to worship and say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. But again, the human heart is deceitfully wicked. So what does he do? It's, it's good. We, we, we got that. Confidence builder. Friends, the question that comes to mind in this section, if we were to think and try to apply some things here, the question that the narrative brings about is, who will you run to? Who will you run to? Will you trust in the God of Israel or will you continue on in your ways knowing that the idols worshiped before are nowhere to be found? 
That's all Ahab knew. All Ahab knew prior to this moment was the Baal worship, the idolatrous worship on Mount Carmel that Jezebel had begun. The reality is the Lord provides us really with these divine encounters so that we might respond rightly, right? He has this opportunity. Here's the reality. God is not auditioning for Ahab's attention or affections. What God is doing is he's demonstrating to Ahab that his might and his power alone was working, not his own. That, in part, should have been able to turn his heart. But what we're going to see later on, it doesn't. While Ahab was receiving counsel from Yahweh, interestingly enough, Ben-Hadad was also receiving counsel himself. It's in verses 23 through 25 that Ben-Hadad is told that their initial defeat was due to Israel's gods being the god of the hills. Really interesting part here. At first read, it becomes clear that the Arameans were pagan worshipers. They didn't believe in the God of Israel, and they had no regard for him. So they conclude that it's not because of the power of Israel's God. They conclude they had a territorial geographical advantage. How, how, how cool is that? Their God provided them this great victory here. Friends, this ultimately boils down to the idea, if you really think about it, you, you, you get to the epistemic level of this. It comes down to the idea of luck or chance. Luck or chance within the non-believer's ideal frame of mind today. That rather than seeing life's events as divine actions or allowables of God and his sovereign plan, the world is reduced to somehow mere circumstance or chance. That is what Ben-Hadad and his people came to. Oh, they were lucky. They were in the high mountains. We, 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 we're not good up there. Let's bring them down to our level and then we'll win. However, friends, the reality was that Ben-Hadad had encountered the power of the Lord on the battlefield. No, no, no matter how many degrees, how many accolades somebody has, it cannot and will not be the very thing that can provide promotion. I've seen individuals that had less credentials on the job get promoted to levels of leadership, not because they had the PhD or uh, the seminary degree, but simply because they were faithful to the Lord. They were faithful in the season God called them to, and God promotes them at that particular time. And that simply goes to, to, to show that when you surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, have your way, do what you desire to do, he will show up and show out. And it blows your mind in the end. It blows our mind in the end. As a matter of fact, Paul says the following regarding the wisdom of God and the foolishness of man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verses 27 through 29, I'll read it into your hearing. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29 says this. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. It's an upside down idea. The weak will become strong. The least will become great. So in Ben-Hadad's arrogance and ignorance, he figures that a change in terrain would settle the score this go round. And along with the change in terrain came a change in their personnel on the field as well, that rather than having the 32 allied kings with them on the field, they would replace them with their typical army commanders, right? People will be able to have a little bit more risk on the field, if you will. And from there, he is then advised to regroup their army, refortify themselves, and to prepare for the next opportunity to fight. And as you're going to see in our next few verses, the battle would resume in the following year. The text will actually say in verse 26, at the turn of the year. And I'll explain that in a minute. Check out with me verses 26 through 34. It says this, at the turn of the year, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek 
to fight against Israel. The sons of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went to meet them. And the sons of Israel camped before them like two little flocks of goats, but the Arameans filled the country. So he's showing you here the difference between the armies. Then a man of God came near and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, because the Arameans have said the Lord is a God of the mountains, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand and you shall know that I am the Lord. So they camped one over against the other seven days. And on the seventh day, the battle was joined and the sons of Israel killed of the Arameans 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city and the wall fell on 27,000 men who were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Here's verse 31. His servant said to him, behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Notice how, the, notice how their words are starting to change. Please let us put sackcloth on our loins and ropes on our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps he will save your life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, please let me live. And he said, meaning King Ahab said, is he still alive? Notice the wording that he uses here. He is my brother. Is verse 33. Now the men took this as an omen and quickly catching his word said, your brother. Yes, 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 your brother, Ben-Hadad. Then he said, go bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came out to him and he took him up into the chariot. Ben-Hadad said to him, the cities which my father took from your father, I will restore and you shall make streets for yourself in Damascus as my father made in Samaria. Ahab said, and I will let you go with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and let him go. Interesting stuff here. It gets juicy, about a minute. The writer shifts now, friends, the reader, you and I, to a new season of time, chronology, chronologically, if you will, as the battle is now beginning to ensue. I want you to notice how he begins verse 26, as I mentioned a bit earlier, at the turn of the year. Historically, when it came down to war, when it came down to fighting, men would always fight in the spring in the spring, because it was in the springtime that you would typically have uh, the grass growing for the horses to be fed and to be well nourished in order to go into war and to stampede strongly. So all military expeditions would either happen in the spring or in early summer. And as we're told here, it's at this time in which these two armies are gearing up and they're now ready for battle number two. And the writer includes the details of the sizes of both armies regarding Israel's and Ben-Hadad's. Notice Israel's army is said to be like two little flocks of goats. In other words, they were small in size, numerically speaking, whereas the Arameans, they were so great in number that it, it literally said that they filled the countryside. So what happens again? Well, the prophet of God comes to King Ahab and he reminds him of what the Arameans assumed regarding their previous victory. What did they say? Oh, God of the mountains, it was a terrain, a terrain thing, a geographical thing. You bring them down to the plains, we're going to whoop their tush. That's what they're saying here. And so he then reminds King Ahab that because the Arameans assumed that the Lord was only the God of the mountains, that the Lord would demonstrate power even in the valley. Right? That he's not only the God of the mountain, but he's also the God of the valley. In other words, God is not limited to simple geographical or topographical limitations. He's creator. He is creator God. Therefore, he is not bound by limitations. He is not bound by space, matter, or time. In other words, friends, as my mother would say, I'll show you better than I can tell you. That's what's going down here. And this statement would not only prove as true for Ben-Hadad and his arrogance, but it would also serve as a testimony to King Ahab of the one who provided the victory for him. You see, it wasn't Ahab's militaristic abilities or his methodical 
battle strategies. It was simply the power of the living God by his grace working on behalf of Israel in order to overcome their enemies. Why? Because God loves his chosen people. So the text says that for seven days, Israel camped over the territory of the enemy and they're looking, they're watching, they're observing. And on the seventh day, what happens? Boom, the war ensues. Now remember, again, how many people Israel had versus the Arameans? Again, proportionally, this does not make sense. You were to ask a military general what you would be able to do with 7,000 men, close to 200,000 men, what would he do? At best, we're going to have to make it work. We're going to have to go to the end, but we're going to die trying. This is, this is what's happening here. But yet something's behind Israel's army. Who is it? God himself. The people are moving forward and they are strengthened by faith in what it is that the word of the Lord was spoken by the prophet. Check out the text. The text tells us that the sons of Israel killed what? 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. Because of the siege, we, we see there was a wall that fell. There was then an additional 27,000 that died as well. Again, 7,000 against 127,000 men, yet the victory fell in the hands of the king of Israel. For as no one but God alone can do a victory like that. And can I just put an application piece here into our, our hearts right now? Imagine what the Lord can do in your and my life when we simply just take him at his word. Lord, I know the circumstance looks crazy, but I trust you. Lord, I know that what I'm going through health-wise is difficult, but I trust you. Imagine what he can do. So in the second defeat, Ben-Hadad and a few of his men, they managed to escape the claws and the clinches of death Clearly, again, there was a great force that was behind Israel's army because in verses 31 through 34, we see that Ben-Hadad is now counseled to surrender. That's when you know it's bad. When your army that was close to about 150,000 and now your folks are telling you, hey, let's, let's gather together really quickly. We're going to die if we don't surrender. Let's throw the white flag out there. That's what's happening. And as he's told to surrender because of what's happening here, it's interesting because the official says something very interesting here. He says, I heard the king of Israel or the kings of Israel are merciful. Do you see that? They're merciful. So he suggests that they bind themselves with sackcloth and ropes as a sign of surrender and submission to the terms of the king. But let's Let's, let's get on their good side. Let's, 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 let's rub, the, rub on the shoulders a little bit and tell them how good they are. Ben-Hadad's servants send word to King Ahab, and Ben-Hadad eventually surrenders. And they do so, it's interesting, you gotta, you gotta catch the wording here. They do so by calling Ben-Hadad King Ahab's servant. Remember, Ahab started as the one being called servant, and now Ben-Hadad is looking at King Ahab and he says, no, King Ahab, I'm your servant. Oh, how quickly we fail, uh, how quickly evil friends is going to fall when it comes to the reality that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's only a matter of time. Right now, we think that folks think that the, 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 the enemy is winning, that darkness is, 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 is greater than the light, but there is coming a day where the Lord is going to break forth, open the clouds, and he's going to come forth in victory. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So we, we, we now find that therein lies another issue here, which was something that the prophet had warned Ahab about a little bit prior in the first battle, as a matter of fact, you might recall after the first, after that great showdown between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal, that Elijah did something to those prophets and priests. What did he do? He, he killed them. He killed all 450 of them. And he shows them, here it is, he shows them no mercy. Why doesn't Elijah show them mercy? 
because according to Torah, he needed to kill any and all of these individuals who set themselves up against Torah, against the word of God, and were causing the people of God to be pulled astray. So he abides by the law. God's law, friends, required death of Israel's enemies. And I'm going to bring you here so you can just don't take my word for it. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 15, because I want you to see why Elijah did what he did. There's some people that say, oh, my God, that's so mean. You should. Why, why is there so much violence in the Old Testament? Well, you'll, you'll see. You'll see. Here's what it says, uh, chapter 20, verse 10. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. You see that? However, if it does not make, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the children and the animals and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as booty for yourself and you shall use the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Here's verse 15. Thus you shall do all the cities that are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations nearby. So where the surrender began as a means of servitude, it quickly changed to a treaty of brotherhood. Covenant is about to happen. Where this surrender, friends, initially took Ahab by surprise, something was actually happening in his heart. Here's the issue. Perhaps, and I don't think this is speculation, I just think this is interpretation of the text. Perhaps Ahab looked to the strength of Ben-Hadad as a potential ally for the future rather than considering the counsel of the prophet. The use of the term brother here was not meant as a blood relative. Rather, it was cordial gesture implying partnership for future protection. This treaty, again, to note, not authorized by the Lord, was established to protect Israel from future threats of a rising enemy. Guess who that rising enemy was known as? The Assyrians. It's as if Ahab had completely forgotten and neglected the fact that the Lord had just made a way out of no way for Israel's, not once, Ahab completely failed to see the victory was delivered, not due to the military partnership of other nations, but because of the God of Israel. How quickly we forget where our help comes from at times. I mean, here's where we use the scripture as a mirror into our very lives, that there are times, and I can attest to my own life, that I've gotten beside myself, thinking that I've done something thinking that I've made my own way. But here we're seeing that even for the men in Scripture, even for this king of Israel, he too made that same mistake. Friends, we're going to see the Lord move mightily in our circumstances through the valleys of life. Yet when we see victory, what ends up happening? Pride swells up. And I did that. Oh, I crushed that review. Did you see me? Rather than relying upon the strength of the Lord. And Ahab fell into that same pot. Rather than trusting in the Lord, Ahab thought it was better to actually lean upon the strength of this great army that filled the entire country. Man, I see physically this happening. I want that. Compromise can quickly, can happen quickly where there are no values or standards upheld. I'll say that again. Compromise can happen quickly where there are no values or standards upheld. Because when we compromise in our faith, what ends up happening 
it actually leaves room for us to acquiesce to the dependency of others rather than our reliance upon the Lord. It just takes one small compromise. And that eventually, if it's not taken care of and if it's not properly rooted in, in, in trusting in the Lord, it can, it can veer you off stray. So what's happening here. So upon the agreement of this treaty, Ben-Hadad aids in fortifying the land. He says, you know what? The land that we stole, we're going to give it back to you. The stuff that we messed up, we're going to restore it for you. We're going to do all of it. My life will do it. However, as we're going to see, this does not take well with the Lord. Right? It's like a slap in the face almost. Check out verses 35 through 43. Now a certain man of the sons of the prophet said to another by the word of the Lord, please strike me. But the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, because you have not listened to the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as you have departed from me, a lion will kill you. And as soon as he departed from him, a lion found him and killed him. Then he found another man and said, please strike me. And the man struck him, wounding him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. As the king passed by, he cried to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man to me and said, guard this man. If for any reason he is missing, then your life shall be for his life or else you shall pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said to him, so shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. Then he hastily took the bandage away from his eyes and the king of Israel recognized him that he was of the prophets. He said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let go of your hand, the man whom I have devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. So the king of Israel went to his house sullen and vexed and came to Samaria. Although a unique turn of events, friends, this section really sums up the entirety of Ahab's decision and the consequences of his disobedience. I'm not even going to lie to you. The first time I read through this, I was like, how in the world is this connecting? What's going on? I mean, it literally goes from two battles, blood gushing, to a story. This prophet Wanting to be killed, wanting to be stricken. Like, what the heck is going on? The Lord, notice here in the text, the Lord uses this term, the sons of the prophets, to accomplish this demonstrative lesson that he's trying to not only show the king, but I believe by the Holy Spirit show us. And we're told that this no-name prophet in a group known as the sons of prophets said to another member of this group to strike me down. And really quickly, just to explain, sons of the prophets was a school of prophets during that day that were trained in Torah. Imagine the school of the prophets like a seminary. Right. If you're going to study the scriptures to be a man of the cloth, in a sense, you go there. So that's what was happening. And being that this instruction was from the Lord and was given through this man of God, the other student should have done according to what the Lord said. The prophet said, the Lord said, you need to strike me down. And the man who's at the same school that this guy is attending, who they know when the Lord speaks, you need to respond. And what does he not do? He doesn't respond to what ends up happening. Because of his refusal to do what it was that the Lord said through the man of God, he ends up rebelling against the Lord. What ends up being the result of that? Well, he ends up getting killed by a lion. So like any disobedient child, judgment falls upon. We're then told that the voice of the Lord speaks to the prophet who requested to be struck down and tells the other prophet that because of his failure again, he's going to die. Notice here though, this story, if you're catching it, hopefully, it's starting to sound a lot similar to another story that we had heard a few teachings ago. Remember the story of the young prophet and the older prophet and the younger prophet because he didn't obey the Lord? Well, who, how did he die? By a lion, right? So the same thing is happening here. 
Let's keep going, though, because it gets even better. We're then told in verse 37 that the prophet found another man. Potentially, this other individual is another son of the prophets, right? He's in the same school. However, the text lets us know that this particular prophet obeys. He follows what the instructions are. And having struck the man, it now allows this prophet to disguise himself as a man in the army, and he sits on the side of the road waiting for King Ahab to come by. You talk about prudent, wisdom, being being wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove, that's what this prophet is doing here. And notice why he's doing it, because he has to get the attention of the king. He doesn't do it maliciously. He does it in a way that's going to catch his attention. The next part of the narrative, friends, really becomes a bit nostalgic because the prophet now in disguise, he comes across King Ahab who sees him on the side of the road, assuming the man is a wounded warrior and he stops. The prophet cries out to the king with a story now and he's explaining how he was told that he needs to guard a man and if this man escapes, then it would be his life. But if the man who brought the guy here returned, he would be compensated for doing what was right. The prophet continues the story and says that somehow the servant became busy, right? The servant got in his own way. He lost track. He neglected what he was supposed to do. And the prisoner got away. Having heard the story, the king immediately responds to that judgment. He, he, he lets him know, listen, if he neglected his responsibilities, you better believe he's going to experience this judgment. It, it was at this moment, friends, that the prophet then takes off the disguise. He takes off the eye patch and he looks up and he stands up and he confronts the king. And you can only imagine King Ahab's mouth drops. You one of those prophets. You're one of those prophets that my wife's been trying to kill, that's been hit by Obadiah. You, you're, you're one of these guys. I wasn't expecting you. Really quickly, here's just a point of application. Truth concealed will always be revealed. You, 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 you will always have to confront truth whether you're trying to hide from it or not. It's going to find you. And that's the reality of the point. People don't want to confront truth. And now this king has to face it head on. This moment, hopefully you've caught it by now, it actually resembles another classic situation. You, you know it, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. You remember David and Nathan? Nathan tells David this story about this man who does this wrong thing. And David says, this man needs to be judged rightly. And Nathan tells him, you are that man. You're that guy. It's interesting because storytelling has a very powerful way of allowing us to see ourselves in the narrative. And once we see ourselves in the narrative, we're forced to face ourselves right in the mirror. Friends, that, that's really the point of biblical narrative. That's why I love biblical narrative so much. You and I must face ourselves with the ugly truth that is presented before us. And the reality is it will either convict us to respond according to truth or it will keep us blinded and we refuse to see who we really are. Some will quickly come to a narrative like this one and say, man, that's an interesting story. That's a, that's a very cool historical lens that I'm looking at right here. What, what an amazing Bible story, they'll call it. No, 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 no. Really look into that text and what do you really see? It's interesting uh, because the word of the, of the Lord actually tells us that Scripture itself is a mirror. 
Scripture is a mirror. You don't believe me. Okay, that's fine. James chapter 1, verses 23 through 27. Go there with me really quickly. I'll read it into your hearing if you can't get there fast enough. James 1, 23. Check out what it says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of God is either going to convict you or repel you. One of the two. One of the two. Well, from the completion of this story, it's interesting because the king's response is what I'd expect. Hopefully it's what you would expect. Because the prophet tells him, because you have let go out of your hand, the man who I devoted to destruction. Again, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet. Therefore, your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. The prophet puts the card on the table, right? He, he, he says, here it is. And Ahab, he, he, said, he lets them know, you let the man go. This man was supposed to be destroyed. And because of your negligence to the instruction of the Lord, you now face rightful judgment. Now, one may ask the question here, where in this narrative did the Lord say that Ben-Hadad was to be killed? Do you see it anywhere between verses 1 and here? You don't see it anywhere. The reality was, friends, the writer does not include it in the narrative. That's just the reality. However, it is to be assumed. Why? Because based upon what we have just read in verse 42, he said, you've been told to do this. If the Lord has held Ahab to his word, it means that at some point it had been revealed to Ahab prior. Uh-oh. There's confliction here. There's a bit of a conflict. What's the conflict? Ahab saw fit to neglect the instructions of the Lord because he saw a physical deliverer himself. Then Hadad can deliver me. But the Lord delivered you twice, Ahab. But Ben Hadad, I can see. Ben Hadad, I can interact with. Is the Lord going to acquiesce to what I want? No, but Ben Hadad will because I got power behind me right now. Isn't it interesting how you got to. You ever seen those cartoons where you got the small guy, the small puny guy is like, you better leave. Alone, and then the, the big buff guy comes behind him, and he's still being taunted. But now the big guy standing in behind the little guy, and the guy who's trying to bring about just evil towards one person, he looks at the big guy, and he's like, Oh, you know what? You're right, you got it. I'm wrong. That, that's what's happening here. He, he, he's, he's got to back off now, friends. And as one could imagine, hearing this word that you're going to die. Your people are going to die, have to be a sobering reality for King Ahab. Because it's in verse 43, I'm wrapping up here. We're told that upon the king's arrival home, that he was sullen and vexed. The word sullen in Hebrew simply means to be in a gloomy and darkened state, almost depressed and downcast. But at the same time, the text lets us know that he was also vexed, vexed. Literally, he was angry and furious. He, he is probably sullen at the fact that his life was soon about to come to an end, as we see, and we're going to see later in chapter 22. But furthermore, he's angry. Why is he angry? He's angry at both himself for failing to have listened to the word of the Lord, but then he's also angry at the prophecy itself. You mean I can't do what I want to do? You mean I can't have it my way? No, you can't, Ahab. I'm the Lord. And because you did not obey my word, 
because you did not submit to my word. After I've shown you grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, eventually grace will run out. That's the scary reality. Because every time a non-believer hears the gospel proclaimed, but yet they do not respond to the truth, what ends up happening? They have to face the reality when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They have to stand before a holy, living God and face the reality that time and time I've come to hear the gospel. I've heard the good news. I've heard about how good God is. I've heard about his faithfulness, but yet I did not respond. Friends, this is the reality. Isn't it interesting that when we have been the primary cause of our issue, that we would rather seek to blame shift our downfall on other people rather than examining ourselves? Really and truly, it's the oldest trick in the book. You don't believe me. Remember when Adam Eight of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? And how does Adam respond? You remember how Adam responds? Let's go over there really quickly. Genesis 3, verses 9 through 12. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, God, said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Check out verse 12. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Adam completely ignores the fact that the Lord gave who the instruction first? Him. You want to blame your wife? Really? But I gave you the instruction, Adam. Adam blame shifts his frustration and his missteps on his wife. And here we find King Ahab having neglected his duty, upholding the word of God, yet he fails to do so because he thinks that he's got it under control. Friends, the lack of obedience becomes the downfall which leads to rightful judgment. Here's the reality. We are all, we were all doomed for the rightful wrath of God to fall upon us. But at the right time, God sent his son. Jesus fully accomplished the law and obeyed the Lord to a T, knowing that we could never be able to do it apart from his divine help. So, he who knew no sin put upon sin became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God. His innocence for our guilt, our blame for his blamelessness, our brokenness for his beauty. Friends, Christ obeyed the Father so that we would ultimately be able to walk in obedience under the power of the Spirit by his way of righteousness. The word of the Lord and his truth will either do one or two things. It will either move you to respond to truth or it will repel you and you will be vexed. You will be angry. can only imagine the people that are screaming in hell right now. I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. Maybe there's a non-believer who will be listening to this later on down the road. I pray that you don't miss it. The opportunity to respond to truth is available. Ahab has shown grace over and over again. The question is, will you respond to the knocking of the Spirit of the Lord on your heart or not? That's the question. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you allow your truth to be made known, how you allow circumstances in our lives to bring us to that culminating point to realize who you are, Father. And I pray that hearts will be open, minds will be open, eyes will be open to know the truth. And the truth is that Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago came, died, was buried, and raised from the dead according to the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you will open up 
eyes to see, ears to hear. Move men and women from death to life that they may come to know you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.